We've got Steve Ward, our game Tough or Love, and the Love Lab app, and Mochi Golden, today on It's Complicated. You're listening to It's Complicated with your hosts, Jennifer Golden and Lauren Leonelli, coming to you live from the AfterBuzz TV studios in Los Angeles, California. Hey everyone, welcome back for another episode of It's Complicated. The struggle is real when you're dating in the city. I'm Jen. And I'm Lauren. <laughs> Today, our drink of the day is Blue Moon. Because this beer saw us standing alone, without a dream in our heart, without a love of our own. Sad. But now we're over the moon because we have a master matchmaker in the studio today, and we're going to pop this puppy open and drink it. Yeah, we are. Um, guys, we've got Steve Ward on the show. Um, Steve is an expert on love, dating, and relationships. He was the host and ex executive producer of VH1's hit show, Tough Love, mm -hmm. and he gained notoriety for his no-nonsense approach to life and love over six successful seasons. Jeez. Steve's also the CEO of Master Matchmakers, an exclusive high-end matchmaking service that has been coaching and connecting eligible singles to one another for over... 20 years. No big deal. Founded by him and his mom, who's also his business partner, the firm has grown nationwide with a staff of more than 20 professionals working together coast, coast to coast. To coast. They're just reaching all of the places. And Stephen's advice in dating and relationships has been sought after by many magazines like Cosmo, Red Book, Glamour, Us, Weekly, People, just to name a few big ones. No big deal again. Um, he's also appeared on TV, national TV, numerous times. Like shows um, like Extra, Good Morning America, Good Afternoon America, <laughs> just in case you were a li little late to the game. Today, Late Night with Jimmy Fallon, Rachel Ray, The Katie Couric Show. He also has a book called Crash Course in Love, and it's authored by him and his mother, Joanne. Um, and she has been a master matchmaker for over 25 years. And um, they are just both refreshingly honest. Um, they have, you know, lifelong experience with their clients and, you know, they've got fans and family and friends and they're just great people that give it to you straight and they're going to set you up with love. Yeah, they are. And so in 2008, Steve started doing Tough Love and that was produced by Drew Barrymore's company Flower Films and High Noon Entertainment. Um, and it premiered in 2009 uh, and it involved eight single women living in one house, all struggling in love. Using unconventional tactics, uh, like conditioning. He's like a zapper, yeah. basically. He, like, tases you. Um, <laughs> he and his mom give the participants crucial dating and relationship advice in a sometimes harsh but effective way. Intended to bring dramatic improvement to their love lives. I would relate to that because I like it given to me straight. And I feel like he's going to do that today. Yeah. Um, you know... He's obviously very seasoned, and he's been on TV and in magazines and has a book and stuff, and he was also nominated uh, by George, um, help me with this Greek last name, Set. Setsekos? Setsekos. I think I did it. Um, he is one of Philadelphia Business Journal's 40 Under 40, um, the dean of Drexel University, and uh, you know, he's recognized as like a very young, professional, outstanding, successful businessman in the community. Um, and he was selected from like 250 nominations. So not only is he like helpful emotionally and, and there for like personal things, he's also just very successful business-wise, which shows you that like all of this is sort of working. I mean, clearly what he's doing is working to make money and to help people, which is the best combination, I think. Good for him. Yeah. Man, inspiration. Yeah, so we're gonna get Steve in here. We're gonna talk about the importance of tough love because we do really think that is quite important and how he became the master matchmaker he is today. Yeah, but That's first, right. we're going to air, uh, air our, our dirty laundry and yeah. tell you what we've been up to this past week. Um, I had drinks with old friends on Friday night, and it was really fun to catch up and see where everybody's at and drink a lot. Uh, so that yeah. was a good time. And then on Saturday, had like a total girly day, did yoga, then went and got a manicure and a massage, and then went to dinner and drinks for our friend's birthday. You were out of town. Yes, I know. I missed and it. I'm it was sad. very, like, you know, just 
informal and Mellow. fun and chill. Where'd and, you like, guys go? Uh, we went to a restaurant called Commerson in yes. sort of West Hollywood. It's yeah. actually right by you. It's really good food. And we ate a lot, drank a lot of great rosé for whatever reason. Ooh. He's like, I'm 36 and I want rosé all night. And he's a dude that looks a like lot, Mr. Clean. <laughs> yeah, a lot. A big muscly dude. A lot of guys like are kind of into rosé. Our friend Greg was kind of into it. Like They don't know they like it until they try it and then they try it and they're like, oh my god. Well, because, okay, red can be a sort of sleepy town and white is like a little bit too, like, crisp. Mm -hmm. So then I yeah, feel like can be, yeah. rose is like a soft, sexy mix. Yeah, it's like but, soft and refreshing, too. Right. And they don't know, they think because it's pink, it's like, oh my god. But it's fucking good. It's good. And so now men are drinking it all over the world <laughs> and good. Rose all every day. Um, and then I had a puppy play date. Because I decided my dog needs a boyfriend. If I'm not gonna have one, she should yeah. have one. Maybe we'll both have one. Yeah. It's gonna we're, our schedules Maybe are gonna your get even busier. Boyfriend will have a boy dog that can be her boyfriend. And then it's like, oh my god. And it's a Hallmark movie I've always dreamed of. Oh my god. I know. I, somebody write that quick or just send me the guy with the dog. Perfect. Great. Um, but she had a freaking blast mm. and loved every minute of it. And like. I, the dogs were like humping her and she was okay with it and then I was Sounds like am I a bad like, mom because no. I'm letting this happen like a train is literally being run on my dog well like, it sounds like maybe like mother like daughter. Maybe, or maybe I'm overcompensating in one area, so she just like she's gonna do all the like the sexy time right now. Okay. Like we're gonna trade off. So now she's getting busy. But so it was great. She had a good time. She has two boyfriends though, not oh, just one. Because well, it was two again, dogs. Like and mother her. like daughter. <laughs> you know, you gotta have options. Okay. You gotta have options. Um, you guys, speaking of drinking with old friends, I went to Scottsdale, Arizona. This last weekend for my basically sister's bachelorette party. Holy mother of God, have you ever been there? I'm like Scottsdale, sounds like Republican, stuffy, rich area. And it is, but also. No, it's, it's dirty Scottsdale. Like fucking Vegas. Dirty Scottsdale. I. I, I got there late because my flight was delayed and everything fucking took forever. And then I got there and it was like 11 and the hotel was around the corner from like all of the bars. And I walked from the hotel like two blocks to the bar that I was going to the Dirk Bentley Whiskey Bar, which I was like, fuck. How country of you. Like, so all the white people. <laughs> and I got there and on the way I laughed out loud the whole two blocks. Like just looked at people and laughed. Like it was insane crazy it was really fun though again it was like a bunch of old friends and we all just sort of like laughed and made fun of each other and drank and went to the spring training and then went out again and i had a hard time keeping up with everyone not gonna lie i feel like i'm old but whatever it's fine the you wedding... lost your edge oh my god it's hard to drink all day in the sun um and then i went to uh her wedding is in april so that's gonna be fun um and I was only away That's from... That's pretty back-to-back. -back. Do they? Do people normally do that? Yeah, I mean, I also think she's just like, whatever, I don't fucking care. Like, it's not like we need all this time in between. It's like, just come if you want, and then the wedding's in like a month, and it, I think it's fine. She's, it's kind of, her wedding's going to be great, but like also it's small and kind of low-key. Where is her wedding? In um, Mill Valley in the Bay Area. Okay, it's so very nice. at least if you have to go to a wedding, like, at, these are fun places to go. Mm -hmm. So... You're not like in bad shape. Yeah, I'm going home, just back home right. just for the wedding. So and and last minute, she's like, "I have room. Bring your boyfriend." <gasps> so that's fun. So I'm excited that yeah. Anyway, um, and <laughs> I'm sorry, just got a funny text from from my boyfriend. I'm planning his birthday party. That's happening too. Yeah, still happening. And I'm calling him Birthdayzilla. He's being like everything I send him. He'd be like, "But can you change that?" I'm like, "What the fuck?" dude i thought he would just like not really care but he's like kind of he's like birthdayzilla well he's a pretty i feel like he's good at planning he so is he's pretty particular probably in the way he would do things but that's why i told you i'm like you gotta just plan it and like well tell him there's to show a lot up. of things that he doesn't know about but like with the invitation i want to make sure like a second set of eyes is looking at it it says the right address things and blah 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 um so yeah and i really missed him while i was gone i was only gone for like two days but i got home and like drove to his house to see him and his daughter because it was like oh it's sad um and last night i had my reality tv heart explode with joy because i got to see andy cohen interview like one of the founders of reality tv and um it was mike darnell and he was quite a character and there was a panel of other hosts and things it was so fun that is i fun. love andy cohen so hard Hard? Hard. Oh, you love him hard. I, I love him it. hard. Um, he's our spirit host. He is. I love him so much. And you know what I love about him? And I feel like this is how we are in our own way. But his interviews feel like conversations. 
Yeah. Like he just would like, you You definitely want to feel like if you're watching somebody ask somebody questions, they're gonna ask the questions that you want to know. Yeah. So if they say something, you can't glaze over it. You gotta like, and Andy Cohen does a really good job of asking what everyone else is thinking. Totally. I love him. And he's like, no shame, no nonsense. Oh yeah. Unfiltered, doesn't care too if people fire back at him. It's just mm -hmm. a, com it's like, what I like about him and sort of like this environment that we're in is like, it is, everyone's on the same playing field. Yeah. And like, he makes you feel like you're hanging out with him versus he's interviewing you. Oh yeah. So For sure. What you said, and then I said it again. That's right. <laughs> Basically. Mm -hmm. um, but guys, we have Amelia, who's yes. part of our It's Complicated Two Drunk Girls team That's in the right. studio. Oh, hello. Hi. Thank you for having me. Of oh course. My God. Yes. She's been behind the scenes, but we wanted to bring her out from yeah, behind. Yeah, like a little in studio audience. Yeah, I know. you are. In studio audience, like production help, bounce ideas off of. Oh, chiming yeah. yes. in all of the things all the things so we're gonna talk about our like favorite celebs right now because Val Kilmer oh my god is like making Twitter his like marquee of love for Kate Blanchett it's like love letters it's kind of crazy it's the craziest especially because she doesn't have Twitter so he's like right. writing his like affection for her whether it's in like a respect kind of way or he actually like loves her it's very hard to tell like where it's coming from because it's a little creepy but then he he sort of just calls himself out too he's like i know whatever like i'm in love with her like in a, one way or another he kind of like just says it yeah and he, he like hashtags her name it's like there's no secret clearly here and he even like defends the fact that he knows her husband and it's like if I were her husband, I'd be like, should we get a restraining order? <laughs> like, what's <laughs> up with this fucking dude? I don't know. Also, does he still act? Yeah, I mean... What was that Blind movie he was in? Oh, my God. Was it called Blind or something? What was that? Marissa, do you know what it was? I don't know. Do you... It's probably too... Mm -hmm. Amelia's probably too young. To Damn. Know. Well, but yeah, him. he is. At, I don't know what the fuck it was called, but he was blind and and, and then in he, he got to see or something. It looks like a really. I'm sorry, I thought it looked like a good movie. Well, at first at, sight, yeah. whatever, sure. Blind. That one. Blind. <laughs> the opposite sight. Of blind. Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, anyway, he's like the number one Kate Blanchett fan club. So. Yeah. I mean, hey, at least she's got one. At least she's got one. Good for um, him. We, yeah. I know. We are fans of Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell. They just <gasps> relationship have like, goals. Their 34th wedding anniversary, and I'm not gonna lie, like, <sighs> I don't disagree with that idea that they're I not married I, 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 I like I sort of don't really feel like I need to get married I mean I just want a diamond that's I think that's cool my mom and her dude are engaged like really just like to say we're really committed we're extra yeah. committed than just but they're not going to actually have the ceremony right and so it's sort of like the ring is like a sign of the commitment to the other people in the yeah. world but that's it I don't know. What do you do? You want to get married, Amelia? I okay. Don't care. So I'm binge watching Sex in the City right now. Oh shit! I just got past the season where Carrie and Aiden are engaged, but oh, she's not ready wow. to get married, and she doesn't know she ever wants to get married. It's because she didn't want to marry him. Mm -hmm. True. Okay. True. Yeah. But I also I don't know. I kind of feel like maybe it is an old institution. It might you know? be. Like I who totally knows? have no qualms about being with a guy I'm with forever. I, I'm not worried about that. I just don't care and then I think about a wedding and it stresses me out right and like I but get you could nervous do a tiny one and elope or something I you don't have to I do can. the big like that's rigmarole. true but then I feel like if you do it you have to invite people and then it's like fuck and then everyone's staring at you and I you have think to... parents really or yeah. like siblings if you're gonna go or like your real inner circle I feel like you could do a wedding for 25 or less I don't know maybe but, but here's the thing also like Kate, I mean, Goldie was married before and yeah. had two kids. Yeah. And then, like, didn't Kurt have, like, other I don't know. But I think he might, but their families combined, and, like, Kate Hudson tweeted about her parents' anniversary, which I think is cute because I feel like, I don't know if how involved her biological father was, but it's cute that she feels so connected. Yeah, she and was, she's, like, probably seven when they got together or something was, real young. So, yeah, she was obviously raised by him, and Goldie says, you know, the reason why it works for them is that they're choosing to be together, that they haven't made this commitment, and that, I mean, I don't totally, I don't disagree with that, but I'm also like, well, what's the difference? If you broke up, it wouldn't hurt any more or less than if you were married or not. Well, like, I think the legality of it is that you're bound to each other by the law, and now you have to make it work because you are legally married versus you you're choosing. wouldn't you want to make it work to choose 
choose to make it work if you were married or not married. Yeah, but I think it, it, what she's saying is it's her choice versus, like, there's this added layer of the law that is I connecting guess, them. but I mean... It's just them wanting to actually be together and make it work because, like... They could go their own way, but they're choosing to be together. Versus when you're married, you, like you say, like for better or for worse, like you're legally yeah. bound and all that jazz. I mean, I guess, but you still ch could choose to go your own way or not, and then you just have to do paperwork. Like, right. I get it. I just, I also kind of don't think that, like, I feel like I have to get married. I don't know how I really feel about it, but I do want a diamond and I do want a commitment. Well, that sounds, diamonds are forever anyway. That's like commitment that. enough. But here's the thing, too, going back to, like, the institution of marriage. I think if people have a first marriage behind them, getting married again isn't that important. That's because also thing. their kids are kind of grown. Yep. And, like, they have a dad. And, like, they're going to grow up and be just fine. But if you have a kid together in your first, like, situation, I feel like you get married because you are a family unit. Yeah. And that's why you do it. Like, it just... Kind of. I mean, I could change my last name without getting married. I could do all those things and, you know, you connect could. myself to the children or whatever. But I don't know. We'll see. Just diamond. Diamond. That's all we got. That's here. all. That's all we got here. And then Kate Hudson, speaking of really quick, she has like a new boyfriend. She's like kind of the op. I mean, I know Goldie had a relationship and kids, and then she's been with Kurt forever. But Kate's like flim flaming all over the place. She and from has, musician to musician. She always has a motherfucking boyfriend, dude. Kind of well, she's super cute. She is cute. But, but like, like, I feel like she's in relationships for, like, sort of a while. <sighs> and then she had kids and gets married to them and or doesn't or I whatever. I just kind of don't take her seriously. I don't know if I do or not, but she really likes a good musician. That's she for does. sure. She yeah. has a very yeah. specific... It's not even like she likes artists. She likes musicians. She does. Well, Girl's whatever. got a type. She, she's got a type. Um, really quick, if you have a type, then you're going to need to double tap the app and get your love verified on Love Lab because this thing is Jen Golden's jam. Uh, stranger danger no more. No because more. Because everyone's fucking signed, sealed, and delivered and verified. Yeah, so they verify you based on your phone number and your, like, social media and everything seems like it's all secure and set up and uh, things. Background check, sign background me up. Background check. Because yeah. here's the thing. If you get in a stranger's car on, like, an Uber or something like that, are you really going to go out with a guy that doesn't have a background check? I don't know. You're spending more time with that guy and you have no flim flam about his background. I guess not. <laughs> I mean, listen, I would 100% do this if I was doing the dating app thing still. But you, fortunately, don't have to because you have a lovely boyfriend. Yes, but and I don't need to check his background. Maybe no. I... Someone else did that for you and yeah, verified that's true. him. My... You had a friend that introduced you. I did you. do that. That's true. So it's almost the same thing. But if you want, go to Love Lab and do make a Love Lab ID and do all the things because you need to check yourself before you wreck yourself. And... We're going to talk to the creator of Love Lab, who has joined us yes. in the studio. Hello. Hi, Steve Ward. Hello. Hi. Hello, sir. I think we need you to sit possibly more in the center. Oh. oh. That was my lift letting me know that I arrived. Oh, Ooh. my God. You're How here. You like I it thought was that like, was the studio saying, that, like, That was a sound effect wait, that I, no, I, hold on. I designed just for you that guys. Was Thank like you. His en that's like your entrance chime. Isn't that great? I'm here. Yeah. Like Ding dong. Like it's like the Andy Cohen life. doorbell. Yeah. Am oh. I, oh, look, I am on camera. See, there you, you guys are. have the little, wow. Yeah, now you can see yourself. This, this place feels like a Japanese massage parlor. Why or do you think that? Yeah. You know, when I walked, it's like this real, like, nondescript little strip next yeah. to a, yeah. a vet's oh, office oh, or yes, something like yes, that. Yes, totally. And you walk in through this, like, weird little door, and then there's all these little booths that yeah. you can go into, and it's kind of creepy. Well, it is. Listen, this is like those really good spots in New York where it's like a hole in the wall restaurant, and you go in, and you're like, where the fuck am I? And then you eat the best food ever. That's what's about to happen. You're about to eat the best food ever in this interview. Food. In a Japanese massage. In a parlor. Japanese Yeah, You and might we, get a happy We ending. even have a Korean dog. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> so see how that works? That is great. That's great. Um, okay, so you're like the most master matchmaker ever, and you followed in your mother's lovely footsteps. Yeah. Did you always know you wanted to do that? No. What did you want to do? Uh, I was going to work in banking. Oh. High finance. Yeah. Okay. I did really well in college in the whole money and banking thing, and... Um, had different co-ops. I went to Drexel, Philadelphia, uh -huh. and so we we learned a lot about how businesses should work. And my mom had this really great business where she was just pulling in hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, advertising her services for hire as a matchmaker mm -hmm. in the classified sections or the personal ads in the back of the regional magazines and stuff. Um, and she had a great business doing it, but it didn't. It couldn't scale. 
and she was working out of filing cabinets and folders. And this was right around the time that like MySpace and Facebook and everything started to come out. And I was like, you know, if you don't, you don't organize and get a website and a database and all this together, you're, you're never going to survive. Mm -hmm. um, so I wasn't really planning on going into it full time. But once I started tinkering with it and seeing what the opportunity looked like, I realized, you know, it's a it's a it's a big business opportunity. Yeah. Since then, my mom and I have grossed more than ten million dollars in matchmaking. Holy stars. moly, that's a lot of love. Whoa. Yeah. That's awesome. So you kind of went into the business end of it and ended up actually being like emotionally involved in the act helping people like matchmaking and. Yeah. Well, the the way it worked at the time was people were you know calling the phone number and the ad that they saw. And then my mom was always answering the phones when her and I were sitting face to face. And then when she would schedule appointments to go out and meet these people at like the Four Seasons or the Ritz Carlton and she'd sit in the lobby and she'd get to know them and profile them and find out what they're looking for. And then they would do a deal. Um, she would come back to the office and run the credit card and sit there and do the credit card dance when it would go through. And everything. <laughs> I mean, it was just really cute the way she used to do it. Um, but while she was out on client calls, I was the one in the office answering the phone. And after hearing her sell her own service long enough, I kind of learned the sale through osmosis. Got it. Um, and then I, I, some woman called one day, uh, Lori, I'll never forget. And I went out and I met her at Ponzio's Diner in Cherry Hill. And we had a lovely lunch together. I spent an hour and a half. And then at the end, she cut me a check for $2,500 to give her three matches. What? That's it? $2,500 for three? Yeah. And I, I thought of, I had the perfect guy in mind for her, uh, this guy, Bruce. And her and Bruce got engaged. Uh, he the was the first up. person I introduced her to, and you? that was the last guy I ever introduced her to, and it was the easiest money I ever made. Wow. Yeah, and so I was you're like, like I know I can like, do this. I think oh. I'm good at this game. I'm like, it's, it's actually a lot easier than I thought it was. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't realize the apple kind of, you know, fell pretty close to the tree. Yeah. Um, but then I, I realized that this is a big business. It's a good lifestyle business for yeah. sure. And so my mom and I were doing really well uh, leading up into uh, the, the, you know, the, the financial collapse in 2008 because you know matchmaking is sort of the thing that people will will spend money in their love lives in good times or bad right it's like alcohol cigarettes sure. you know gambling you know when you're doing really well you want someone to spend your life with when you're not doing so well you want someone to spend your life with um so it was, we realized it was a non-cyclical business but when we, we were making a million dollars a year in matchmaking before the the recession hit yeah. fortunately that was the same time that we were discovered to do tough love and so our business shrunk by almost 50% overnight um, when my mom and I started focusing on making that TV show. We did two seasons in 2009 alone. Um, wow. And so it really just took a lot of our energy and focus on doing it, but we've been advertising that ever since because people still hire us today that saw my show sure. five, six, seven years ago. It's a huge I saw reach. It. Yeah. I saw it before we actually met and I was a big fan because I personally believe in tough love and just being direct in general and too. being honest because why sugarcoat things or lie or hurting everyone that's involved in that case. So how did you guys get into like the theme of tough love? Is that just something you guys always practiced? <laughs> practiced. Well, um, <laughs> you know, it's, I'll give you I'll, the God's honest truth was our producer, Pam, who is a great friend of mine to this day. She'll be at my wedding in a few months and um, she's wonderful. She's, if it wasn't for her, the show would have never uh, happened. But I remember the last thing Pam said to me before we decided to do the deal was, is there anything I'm gonna find out about oh, you guys shit. that would make, make us think twice about doing this? And, and at the time I realized that, you know, this was the, the days where you know, when, when people were, and people still do this, but, but back then, you know, if my mom told somebody that if they, as a woman, you know, you're, you're 45, 50 years old, you wanna date guys five to 10 years younger than you, you might need a little work. And my mom would be the first one to say, you need a little work, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And so we got this Nothing reputation. Nothing wrong with that. Well, my, look, my mom's had a lot of work done and she looks wonderful. Yeah. She's proud of it. She owns it, you know? I don't care. Um, it's but, like going to the gym. You got to upkeep. Fuck, I've had Botox. I don't have any now, but I need some. And well, some filler too. But. Yeah. I mean, whatever <laughs> it is, to each their own. I think it's a lot about uh, personal uh, confidence mm -hmm. and self-esteem and things that people have. You know, I, I have clients with body dysmorphia and it's difficult to help these people yeah. deal with their issues. I mean, I was coaching someone the other day on, on my own live show. I, I do a, a Facebook live show once a week on my Facebook page. And this girl who, who lost 100 pounds three times in her life. Shit. And the third time, she needed a gastric sleeve to do it. The first two times, she did it naturally. Now she has all these you know, issues about guilt, feeling like she cheated her way oh, down. Boy. Oh, boy. Oh, God. And it's really terrible, right? And, so yeah. she, and now she has this body dysmorphia. And and so far, 
she hasn't been able to talk about it and deal with it. And look, I'm not a trained therapist. I just know what works. Sure. And so what I said was, well, number one, you're talking about it now. And we're talking about yeah. it. Yeah. And you got about 50 people listening and they're all commenting and, and cheering you on. And, and I bet there's a lot of people out there that can relate to what you're going through. I go, if I were you, I'd start a blog or my own podcast. Good call. And I call yeah. it, I lost 100 pounds three times and this time I mean it. Oh my yeah. God, that's so cute. You know? No, because talking about it, it, I mean, yes, there's professional therapists and that is obviously therapeutic or whatever, but we just talked about this on our last show too, like talking about it with someone who knows you or personally, like a friend or someone like in your position, that also helps. Or just writing things down. It's like, it helps get it out. So yeah. that is a total therapeutic experience and to just help her work through it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. in this atmosphere, I feel like everybody can have a blog or a podcast, like, or a Facebook Live. Like everyone can reach other people now and people are starting to do it more and feeling less filtered and yeah. it's not so taboo to like you just said I've had Botox I mean I've had Botox and we can all I've just had Botox. right and so we can all say these things now I think because people aren't afraid and strength in numbers so like yeah. you said it first and the two of us just said it. oh I don't give a fuck right no, and then so well, this yeah. girl should say what she's feeling and then like she can help people she can get advice I always great. feel I personally feel like safety in numbers for me like if someone's telling me a problem I like to say and it's not like I'm turning it around on me like that happened to me too or but because I that is what makes me feel like okay about something so that could that's again a very therapeutic thing to make someone feel like I get you well in in the context of matchmaking what we realized early on was okay a lot of people who come to us hat in hand are single for a good reason and if we're gonna spend all this energy trying to find someone to introduce them to who we hope that they'll get it off with so then we don't have to keep introducing them to anyone and that's what makes us profitable that's our margin is in success it's mm -hmm. not in failure sure. right so when we realize that people are self-sabotaging or getting in their own way doing things to ruin an otherwise perfectly good match I gotta smack you around for it. I of mean, if course. I don't if I don't tell you what you're doing wrong, I'm just wasting my time. Right. Yeah. It's costing me money, right? So that was the impetus for tough the love. The tough love. To what your What did you think was? I mean, every situation is different, clearly. But what was something like a trending theme that you felt like was a, something that someone would constantly do to sabotage that more than one client would do? Well, that's what that's what helped us develop the coaching practice, right? So I have now. I'll never forget this, right? It was during post-production on season two of Tough Love, and season one had just aired. And I'm sitting on a couch in Santa Monica, and I'm watching TV as I'm doing all my other work for my matchmaking business, and I'm getting contacted from women all over the country uh, in areas where I have nobody to introduce them to. And yet, they're they're asking for help in their love life. Like and where, I, Kansas or something? Yeah, all over the place. I mean, I literally have Wichita? Clients, I have clients in all 50 states now. Wow. Yeah, I mean, literally, Alaska and Hawaii, all Shit. over the place, right? So Everyone needs love. Well, right. at the time, I was like, okay, I can't match you, but what could I do for you? And, and wow. I see that there are these glaring blind spots that they have. They don't even realize, okay... The photo you sent me, your jeans are up to your chest. Okay, like have a party and, and invite and, your pants down. You know, and there's there's women out there who who, who wear these high waisted jeans and they can do it because they got the body type for it and they can pull it off. But then if you don't, it's, it's like a mess. mom jeans central. It's bad. So <laughs> so little things, right? And yeah. So I'm watching TV, and I see a commercial for weight loss counseling. You know, out here in LA, they can sell you any kind of service. Sure. Yeah. And I see this weight loss counseling, which is. As a matter of fact, my mom was doing that in the early 80s for Jenny Craig mm -hmm. before she ended up going into the dating business back in 1986. Um, so it, it kind of, we've come full circle. I'm watching TV. I'm looking at these leads that are coming into my website. I hate to say it, but but much of these people are, are the average American, right? The average American woman is five foot four, 165 pounds. And I'm sitting there thinking, I can't match this woman if I tried. Not only that, if she is trying to match herself, she needs to do some things to get to where she, she wants to go. Sure. Um, and that's when I thought of, whoa, weight loss counseling, dating coaching, hello. It's yeah. the same, put the fork down, start working out. Yeah. Same yeah. type of common sense right. you sure. know, advice. And so I'm like, all right, why don't I start selling coaching? And and and, and that's in lieu of matchmaking. Yeah. Or to complement. In conjunction with. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. that's how our, our coaching program was born out of tough love. Right. And so I look, I see a lot of people running around today calling themselves a self help coach or, you know, dating coach or master guru. They're teaching workshops. They got books. They got buy my DVD. It's a bunch of bullshit. But you're the master. 
I, but I'm not a master of bullshit. I'm, no, a, I'm a master of common the sense. Right? Yeah. It's common, what it is is you're, I agree. you're illuminating people to obviousness. Yes. Yeah. Obvi- like it's not rocket science. It's not. No, but I common agree. sense is not common. Like for instance, when we talk about these dating yeah. apps, okay. The, the profiles are so horrendous. I want to take my phone and chuck it to another planet because the people on there are worse and worse as you swipe. And I'm like, is this what's left? I don't want to date any of these humans. Not one of yeah, them. Yeah, because you can see, obviously, what they're doing wrong. It's like a glaring, Well, like I you look said. into what they post. So I'm like, okay, these are the choices of photos you picked. What in your fucking brain made you think that was going to be a good idea, yeah. you dumbass? Yeah. <laughs> and then what you wrote is that much fucking Even worse. Even worse. Or you wrote nothing... So you're just one giant mystery of like horrendousness. I can't. Like really though. Yeah, and then yeah. I can't. I just can't. So I'm like, I can't. I'm going to be alone with my dog forever. But yeah, I think having that common sense, it's common, but not to be confused with, it, it's also not, not everyone can do that. It's people, a lot of people have no, I, I think it's one of the scariest human qualities to have the ability to not self-reflect. And I think if you can't do that, then you also can't see what's in front of you either. So being able to like admit what you can see wrong with yourself or other people or just see the obvious, sometimes people don't have that ability and that is frightening. Well, not only that, but I've learned, especially from living in LA the last few years, that um, not everybody is wired the same way yeah. upstairs. Yeah. And, and <laughs> that is very nice of you. That's so diplomatic. And, and yeah. I thought I thought at first it was like gender based, but with all yeah. with everything I've personally learned, just I mean I I lived at Hollywood and Vine for a full year. Oh, I mean yeah. it's like ground zero of LGBTQ. You name it. I mean you're just immersed in it. Yeah. And so you you have to begin to understand. I mean coming from Philadelphia, the community's not as large as it is in West Hollywood. Hollywood, yeah. right? Um, and so. I, I've had an opportunity to embrace people from all different walks of life and understand how they're wired upstairs, right? And men and women biologically are wired different regardless of your orientation because mm-hmm. orientation is just another form of wiring. Sure. But men and women frame things differently and they, they behave differently and they, they have different primal needs and desires. And believe it or not, they haven't evolved much in like hundreds of thousands of years. What is one primal need of a man and one primal need of a female quickly before you go on? So men need validation constantly. They need reassurance. They need approval. Really? Which is why I always say they're so much more sensitive now than ever before. And I think it's because of the dating apps because they know there's so much competition right at people's fingertips. And before they could just like be macho and like go like win. But now it's like, well, I can keep swiping. Yeah, You're not important. And from a woman's perspective, um, women, especially in this digital age that we're now in, they need to feel like the master of space and time in the relationship. Oh. What does the, that mean? They're the ones that control, who, who control That's the in, amount of space wrong. we have, the amount of time we spend. And, and and it's important to them to feel in control of that or they develop a level of anxiety. Yes, I that 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 that, that ta- basically ruins a relationship. Men in their simplest form, they they would prefer a woman to make these determinations so that they know when it's their time. You but know. then what if you're doing that as the the woman in the relationship and you're you're setting the time and you're setting the space and how much or how little there is then what if you're like but what do you want like i'm just doing it so now i don't know if you want to be around me or not so now i'm i'm the one who's driving the bus and now i feel like i'm just telling you what to do what about what you want great question let's put that into context there that a relationship is like politics it's it's there are there are different forms of governing your relationship. You can look at it like Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. Oh. Okay, Putin's a regime. Putin pretty much says how it's gonna be. Sure. So he controls the space and time, but he's telling it like it is. I'm not telling you to dictate oh. what it should be. On the other hand, you have someone like Trump who is so self-absorbed and narcissistic that he believes that he knows what's best for both of you, everybody, yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I appreciate it, I appreciate your point of view, but I'm gonna still make the decision. Again, completely uh, different type of regime, different type of way of governing. If you're more diplomatic, mm-hmm. okay, if you're willing to incorporate their point of view, incorporate their opinion, ask them what they would like, and then decide. Okay, oh. so then you know it's not just you dictating and yes. driving the bus. It's that 
you're saying, hey, I'm presenting you with this thing about maybe taking another step or doing this, and then you watch and see if they follow. So communication? Well, it, communication is a whole nother ball of bugs. <laughs> right? I mean. So when I, all right, look, I'll give you guys some of my, my general advice that I, I give in my coaching to my clients. And, and as I simplify things, right, I've discovered that the virtues of any relationship, romantic, platonic, professional, familial, you name it, um, are communication, respect, and trust. Mm -hmm. Equal parts, right? They have to be measured and equal. Now the problem is a relationship is like uh, a container, okay? And when it's a friendship, it's a coffee mug, okay? When it's a, uh, a relationship, it's someone you're spending your life with, it's like a keg. Yeah, it's huge. Right, and you know, it's large, the, 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 and, and in the words of uh, Khalil Gibran, you know, fill each other's cup, but drink not from the same cup. Right, so, oh. so so what happens is now, you have these containers that, that are larger or smaller based on the, the let's call it the, the level of significance of the relationship in your life. And so you have a different level of communication with each person, a mm -hmm. different level of respect and a different level of trust, but all those levels have to be equal sure. and commensurate, mm -hmm. right? Otherwise the whole thing goes out of whack. And when you find that you're lacking in one, you can actually concentrate on the other two to make up for it. Right, if you feel like there's communication missing, right, you go to them with trust and respect. It's like, look, I don't uh, want to assume you're running around on me when I don't hear from you all weekend. I don't want to do that. But that's what's going to happen when we don't communicate all weekend. And I'm used to talking to you at least over text five days out of the week. Sure. So when two days go by, Saturday and Sunday, the only two days you're off of work. That's fishy. And it should be easier for us to yeah. communicate. You go MIA, that's kind of odd. So Right. To me, it's, it's I, I respect you and I trust you. So I'm coming to you and telling you I got a problem with that lack of communication, right? So you leverage the other two. Sure. In order Do you to think that that's why, okay, people say like that men make women crazy and like, the, I mean, you always hear like men think women are crazy and women think men are assholes, but I think it sort of feeds off of each other. It's cyclical. So like... Mm -hmm. A man might, let's say, do what you just said, like maybe go MIA Saturday and Sunday, and then the woman starts to get crazy because she has the anxiety and she might not know how to communicate as well as you did yes. and say, I'm going to start feeling this way if you don't communicate with None me. None of these situations will ever turn out okay unless you can have, I think, a conversation about it and take responsibility for my insecurity or the insecure like there's two people here i might have an insecurity but it's because let's talk about why that insecurity might be fed or i'll take responsibility for my part in it but you're also making it turn into a thing like you said sort of like if you're not if you're texting me all week and then all of a sudden you're not yeah. let's both take responsibility here and i think coming to i found in the relationship i'm in coming to my boyfriend with always kind of saying that it feels less like you're blaming and more like I understand my role in the situation, but also let's talk about how, look at it through my eyes, how that would make me feel. And then it, it's easier to hear things that yeah. way, or even in a friendship or whatever. I think it's easier to hear things that way when you say like, okay, I did this, but also this is happening to feed that. Like people have to take accountability, yeah. I think. Yeah. But it also comes with being able to communicate. And I think people are sometimes scared because they don't want to hear what the other person might say or True. they don't want to seem like they're getting more serious than the other person is. Or yeah. Well, and that's where you get into the orders of magnitude. You see, oh. let, let's be honest. Each, each, every relationship, most relationships are, are harmed due to self-inflicted wounds. It's mo most relationships aren't harmed by external factors or external events. Sure. Most of the harm is is internal conflict that's between the two people involved, and 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 the triggers, or the stimuli or whatever is happening outside of the two of you that's causing the the conflict is is really noise. More, it's it's really more. It's not the it's not the. Um, it's not the disease, it's the symptom. Yes, mm -hmm. right? totally The disease agree. Is, is from within the relationship and this, you know, what Jen referred to as a lack of communication, mm -hmm. but it could be a lack of respect, it could be a lack of trust. It's it's usually one, two, or all three of these issues. And just gets exacerbated by the outside noise. Yeah. It's gonna keep manifesting itself through whatever it can find, but it's sure. always the one, two, or three problems. Right, and so to Jen's point, you know, knowing what stage you are in your relationship is so crucial because the level of communication you ought to have, the level of respect and trust you ought to have, 
when you're seeing someone casually is much less than the threshold for when you're seeing them exclusively sure or when you're 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 making a commitment and open you know to that that is you're expressing to your your friends and your family and to the world to say we've decided to couple right so there's there's that gray area mm. b- between casual and committed yeah. known as exclusivity and that's really what i consider to be the discovery stage of relationship where it's like applying for a mortgage buying a house you know you you you, you apply you get pre-qualified you go through the, the whole application process you, you have the home in mind that you're going to buy and then you have about 60 days to settle exclusivity is sort of the similar sure. window of time and what you're doing is the same thing you're checking title you're looking at insurance you're seeing if the taxes have been paid you're scroll you're escrowing sure. funds sort of you you're, you're, you're really un- you're underwriting now a long-term relationship that you're going to be in together for the next five years minimum seven 15 30 right and and you need to mitigate that risk yeah and so you need to be sure that when you get to commitment you're not going to discover something about them yeah that you should have found out by now right yeah. so how do you do that honoring these virtues mm-hmm. right so at the at the casual stage I say well you're you're net this is more Socratic it's a it's a, a philosophy in which you can determine whether or not you have the necessary and sufficient level to proceed mm-hmm. right? it's just a great way to be pragmatic you know because you might what well, you might be a woman who's I don't know 37 38 39 years old and you want to get married and you want to have kids and so you, I mean you feel like this enormous amount of pressure and so you can't afford to stay casual as long as you did when you were younger you can't afford to even have that 60 day exclusivity period you got to get that shit done in 30 days mm-hmm. and so you got to work harder and smarter and be more efficient mm-hmm. to get it done in a shorter window of time and and unfortunately these are the realities of life and and I'm not a a sexist I'm not a misogynist I'm an observer you know I observe how the world works and I give people best practices for achieving what they want in life and most people don't understand because they they look at life from a from a real um, self-centered point of view sure. very egotistical self-centered point of view and we have to learn how to take ourselves out of that situation hard to do and look, it, it, you do it by consensus. Totally. Yeah. Inviting people that you, friends, family, yep. right. yep. people you care about to yep. chime in on the on, on the choices that you're making. Right. And oh, also, yeah. if you like see trends or patterns, that's because that's true. Self reflect. <laughs> do it. Right. Admit when you do something. Well, people, uh, and like you said, people are just not all that self aware. I actually yes. wrote in my dating profile, like one of the qualities I'm looking for is that the person is self-aware. Now, if somebody reads that and they think that that's like hocus pocus or like that I'm super hippy dippy or they don't know what self-aware means or they're like, she wants too much, then that person's not for me. But if they're also looking for somebody that is self-aware, I actually put it there because I saw some dude wrote that and I was like, good for him that he's actually looking for somebody that is self-aware. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to put that there too. That's a huge thing. Now, is there like, have you ever turned somebody away? You're like, you are uncoachable. Goodbye. You're not matchable. You're not coachable. Off you go. Yeah, all the time. What would and, be and that I, person? And I and I and that happens before and after they've hired me. Oof. And it's written into my contract that I have a right to fire my clients with no refund. You yeah, know? yeah. I mean, it's it's we, we're we're an agent. We're yeah. like the Sotheby's of matchmaking. Yeah. Okay. We're not going to just list any property. Sure. You have to fit our criteria. And if you do things that make us, if you like, you know go on to some for sale by owner website and start listing you. No, 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 no. Yeah. You're fired. We're yes. not representing you anymore. <laughs> I like That's that. not how it works. Don't go, don't go outside the protocol. And people do it all the time. And it's really amazing because you, you really discover why they're single in the first place sure. because of these deep character flaws and defects that they're, they refuse to acknowledge and oh, address. Yeah. Look, I'm the first person to admit my flaws. I, I use it as a technique in my coaching. I call it relational. It's a relational technique. Mm-hmm. It's a way for you to feel like I'm not condescending. I'm not judging. When some girl tells me that she has some form of, of, of like a dysmorphia or um, you know an eating disorder or, or depression or whatever, I said, I'm like, look, I, I have general anxiety. And I cope with it in so many ways. Not all of them are healthy. I've learned over the years how to deal with the restlessness 
which is the manifestation of the anxiety that mm-hmm, I'm feeling. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've, I've found spirituality. I've found really great marijuana. I've found <laughs> a really great prescription. I've found uh, all kinds of living in Santa Monica is nice. You know, there's all sorts of ways to yeah. to dispel these, 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 I don't know what you want to call them, but they've been called many different things over many different, you know, over many periods of time from the Bible to, you know, um, kind of the dark ages to, you know, the enlightenment, people refer to these things that we deal with in different ways. Demons, right. disorders, skeletons. Yep. There's yeah. so many Baggage. Ways. Yeah, so many different Issues. But yeah. we all have them. I totally get what you're saying about anxiety. But do we all have them? Some people think they're perfect. Some people well, have things and-, and, and <laughs> Which is a thing in itself. Right, hi. Right. Well, so, I mean- Call a lot, someone. Well, a lot of people have things that are clear and obvious to others. Like, is it, come on, I already, Trump. Narcissist. It's okay. Right. Yeah. You know? Uh, and guess who doesn't it. care? Him. Oh my God. Because <laughs> he's a narcissist. And, and if you read any literature there is about how to deal with someone, there's no way to govern with someone, especially in a democracy, with someone who has a leadership position and, and, and has that disorder. Right? But then a lot of people don't know. And, and look, I don't expect people to be the, their, their own. Um, you know, licensed therapist. People are licensed to do these things for a reason. They have this, uh, the DSM-5 is now the, mm-hmm. the manual that they use. And there's all, I, I, they call it a spectrum, like the autism spectrum, right? So there's that, that, that realm that you have, but there's also these other personalities where on the far left you have those who are neurotic, right? That have like, you know, they blame themselves for That's most of me. the problems. I'm neurotic. Yeah. Did you see that slow head turn? <laughs> and then you have people on the far right that have these character disorders, and they're the narcissists and the sociopaths. And That's the frightening to me. Yeah, and then so you're, you're, what you want to be is in the middle. Yeah, you want to be just a li- normal. You want to be just a, normal. You want to be a little neurotic, and you want to be a little arrogant. You know, yeah. you want to be somewhere in between, right? Yeah. Um, and and I think that if if you're the type of person who who knows when you're feeling vulnerable, when you're feeling scared, when you're feeling stressed. When you're feeling anxious, you got to remove yourself from that environment yeah. or whatever it is that's causing those things yeah, make and get change, yourself yeah. into a place where you're feeling really good. Like when, when people say to me, you know, oh, I, you know, I live in a small town and I, I burned out the internet sites and I don't go to bars and all my friends are married. And they'll give me every excuse in yeah. the book for how come they can't meet someone on their own. I say, um, is there anything you've ever wanted to do in life that you just haven't done yet? They're like, what do you mean? I go. I love to dance. I don't dance much. I wish I could dance more. I'm not talking dancing in a crowded club at hip hop. No, I'm talking about like showing like the tango. Yeah, like dancing with the stars. Yeah, I want to show off that I actually do have some moves, but yeah. I've never taken a class. Right. Meanwhile, these classes are very social. Yeah. Right. Same thing is true That'd of be cooking. Fun. I've never That'd learned how to cook. I'd love to learn how to cook. Yeah. Cooking for singles. What a great class. Yeah. You know, and you meet a bunch of people that are single like you and you're all figuring out how to cook for yourself. I love it. What a great way to meet people. But think outside the box a little bit. But but go to your go to a place where you're you're curious, you're learning, you feel mm-hmm. safe. Right? Like, okay, so I'm trying to lose a little bit more weight for my wedding. I'm trying to think of clever ways to sweat that are low impact. Ooh. Right? There's this there's a yoga studio in my building called Sweat. Done. There right? you go. Okay. Right there. Right. Walk downstairs. Hey, you guys got some kind of intro or beginner's class? People don't know anything about yoga. I mean, I know nothing. Yeah. Right? Like, even if you have, like, an assigned YouTube video list that I ought to watch first before <laughs> I know what I'm getting, anything would be helpful. Sure. They, should, they highlighted some classes. These are the times to come. These are the busiest classes. These are the ones that are most empty. You go, you go to one of these classes where it's, like, six, seven, eight people in the class. What do you do before the class, after the class? You're talking to people. Sure. When you go to these classes two or three times, you see the same people mm-hmm. going mm-hmm. to the same classes. What happens after you've been there three, four times? Soul cycle, spin class, whatever the hell it is. You start to talk to people. Yep. Yep. It's, you know, are you single? Do you know so I'm single. Maybe we know someone. Maybe you can introduce me to someone you know that might be a good fit for me. I'm open to introductions. Putting it out there. Putting out in the universe that you'd like to meet someone is the first place to start. And I think a lot of people are so uncomfortable with owning their needs and their desires Yeah, that they have a hard time finding someone else who's just like Yeah, because I think they're like admitting a flaw or something. Wait, really quick, how did you meet your fiance? On a bus. 
Cut what bus? Up. Where were you on a bus? I like in a, New York was, or in no, the East Coast or something? It was, it was in Park City, Utah. Oh, no way. Sundance. Uh, no, it wasn't Sundance. It was during, it was, it was a long time ago. It was almost 10 years ago. But uh, it was during Christmas break. And, you know, uh, Park City has the free town bus that gets everybody around yeah. there. So you don't have to get in your car and drive and park and drive and park. So um, I was just on my way with my dad to, uh, to we, were, we were actually going our way back to the hotel. We just got done snowboarding for the day. Madison was sitting across from me on the bus with her dad, as a matter of fact. And uh, they were on their way to go get their rental car or something like that. And I was talking... And, and this was all by design, by the way, because I saw her immediately when I got on the bus, and I knew I needed to figure out a way to talk to her. By the way, this is the type of advice I give my clients now in coaching. And I just start talking to the woman next to me instead. And I'm like, hey, by the way, I'm sorry, do you have any idea, uh, have you heard about this restaurant they have around here? It's like this all-you-can-eat seafood buffet, like high-end seafood. I've heard nothing but great things about this place. I can't remember what it's called, okay? And uh, I'm like, it's like Snow Something, Snow Lodge, Snow, snow Something or whatever. Madison sitting across from me, she goes, it's called Snow Park Lodge, and it's excellent. That's that's how we met. And so she corrected me. That's the first time she corrected me. She's been correcting me ever since. <laughs> and she's great. How did you know she was the match, like the match? You know, I it was love at first sight. I'll be the first Aww. to admit it. Um, but, you know, here's the thing, and I'll, I'm very honest about my past. I've always been, love comes and it goes, it grows and it shrinks. Um, when I met Madison, she was 17. I didn't know this at the time. Uh, I thought she was older. Her dad's nine years older than my dad. So, you know. You just thought, yeah. She's sitting next to her dad. I'm sitting next to my dad. She thought I was younger. I thought she was older. Um, But, you know, there was, we both had a lot of growing up to do. And women mature emotionally faster than men do. And coincidentally, I think we were maturing at the same time until we both got to the point where we wanted the same things and we felt like it was finally right to make that decision to be together. And that was more than four years ago. So okay. we, we, for the last four years, we both pretty much worked from home. So we've been around each other 24 seven for four years. And You've been engaged for a while. Three and a half years. Yeah. Yeah. Cause she, you know, she says to me, you can't throw a rock without hitting someone unhappily married. Yeah. Show me one person you right. know unhappily engaged. True. True. We Every, just, ta- we just yeah. talked about this with Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell. I'm like, I just want a ring and a commitment, but I don't have to actually fucking get married. Like, I don't have to do it. I like will. The paperwork I don't have is so to do it. like you're signing a lease on a house. I like, don't have like to a, do it. Ugh. But I do want a diamond. Sorry, I just do. Yeah. Well, you know what's interesting? Uh, you have Goldie Hawn, you have Kurt Russell, you have Kate Hudson. So the daughter doesn't share a name with either of them. Mm-hmm. You know? Like, my sister is engaged. And she's she's engaged to a guy and who's the father of her children, and I was like, you know, don't you feel weird picking up his kids from school? Oh, well, like they last have his yeah. last name, uh-huh. you know. And you show up, you got a different last name. Sure. You're here to pick up. Who are you? I'm their mother. Yeah. Can I see some ID? I get that. Well, who's Ward? Well, that's my maiden name. Can you give me the kids? They're my yeah. kids. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I, I get, blood I get test. that. Well, How's it people, go? people fail to realize that marriage in the first place was designed intentionally to establish birthrights sure. and legitimacy of offspring. Yeah. So that when the father died, that all these kids that he had with all these different women wouldn't fight over who the property belonged to. Sure. It would be the legitimate children's property. And the one he was married to, those kids get everything. Yeah, And so, um, interestingly enough, not a lot has changed. And I'm getting married in California, so I'm looking at all the laws that are written around here, and there's there's actually a California Premarital Act state law oh. about prenuptial agreements. Oh, What does it entail? All kinds of things. Like, you can't sanction. You know what I mean? Like, if he cheats on you, he has to pay you double the alimony. Like, you can't put that kind of stuff. In Florida, they have that, I think. I, in California, you can't. Interesting. California has weird law. My parents have been separated since I was six and then finally got divorced like way, way later just because of the paperwork. But my mom kept her last name and still does because of her two kids. She was like, I can't not, I don't care. And she still is Deborah Leonelli and remarried. But she's just like, that's too fucking, and we're grown. But it's just like, and it's also 
her maiden name was Johnson. Who wants that? Well, it's like Chris Card. Well, I don't know what her last name is now, but she was Chris Kardashian Jenner. Kardashian Jenner. She, she wanted to change it back to Kardashian because she is not with Bruce Jenner anymore, who's now Caitlyn Jenner. <laughs> anyway, the point is she wanted to change her name back to Kardashian because but she has be Jenner of, children though. It's weird. But, I know. But but if I'm not mistaken, that was another married name. That's not her. Right. Yeah, name. that's not. Yeah, she should be Jenner Kardashian if she was going to be fair about I it. I mean, well, she, she should, should also be, be whatever Kardashian the hell she Jenner as. or whatever. Who knows? Or she could be what she was born. Right. That's what she started. Exactly. What, what is her last name? I, don't I have know. no idea. I, I think she wasn't a person until she became a Kardashian. She and obviously a wasn't. No. Um, um, but so, okay, real fast. You give people advice. Let's go right close to home. Now, you've known me for a bit. Yeah. Um, would you set me up yeah, with somebody? Yeah, yeah. We need to set what's, her what's up. What's like give my her... issue? Yeah, no, I, I actually have someone in mind for you. <gasps> okay, let's do that. Yeah. I mean, this is just so easy. Who is it? And is he my husband? Uh, he could be. I don't know. I mean, we, we matched him up. He he was just matched with someone who's the same age as you. Um, and she really likes him. And he loves her energy and her enthusiasm. The fact that she very much wants to be in a relationship. And those are all the things that he's looking for. Uh, because he'd like to get married. He'd like to start a family. He's yeah. waited all this time. Uh, Can and we he, say how old he is? He's in his 40s. Great. He's done, he's done very well Love for it. himself professionally but you know it's funny 15 years ago when I first started as a matchmaker um, you know a 40 year old guy who's never been married and had no kids was like you were you avoided them like the plague they were like the spinsters of <sighs> yeah you were you're like whoa there must be something wrong with you yeah yeah to 40 and you hadn't been married yet right? yeah well obviously things have changed those men are now the unicorns they went from zombies to unicorns, <laughs> just like that in 15 years. For sure. It's amazing how society's changed. Now, this is systemic, okay? This is not coincidence. This is something that actually is, it's like a tectonic shift that's been taking place for, for 30 years. And it's, we're just now getting to this, this kind of tipping point where people don't understand. And there's a great book I recommend. It's called Date Onomics. Oh, uh, we've interviewed yeah. him. John. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, John, great guy. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, He's really done a great job of, of dissecting the data, and he has a researcher from SUNY Albany who he who goes into the bureau, the Labor Bureau statistics, because government puts all this data online now. You can go to data.gov and extrapolate all this Census Bureau data about people. But Crazy. even Census Bureau data is dated. Anyway, he concluded that due to all you know, and he had his thesis is sound um, due to things like Title IX due to things, which was an NCAA rule that um, colleges needed to spend the same amount of money on scholarships for female athletes as they did for the male athletes. So schools with huge football programs and, and stuff were giving out female scholarships for volleyball, golf, fucking badminton, Spinning. tennis, you name it. But what it did was is it, it put a lot more women in college mm -hmm. who were otherwise unable to afford the education. Um, and then as society has shifted from being the whole you know, barefoot and pregnant type of, of woman to being the, the career oriented, having it all type of woman, um, women decided to put more of an emphasis on getting education and getting a career and being successful. I was working with a client last night, her name's Leslie, she's a wonderful woman. And I said to her, I go, you know, it's interesting because of all these things that you've done in your career, and she's a super talented plastic surgeon now, but before she became a plastic surgeon, she was a general surgeon. She was a brain surgeon. She was she, 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 she ran different burn units around the country. She specialized in pediatric burn cases. Wow, Holy right? Moly. So all this different crazy types of surgery that she could do any type of surgery on the human body, she's now capable of doing, right? But she's never been have, able to have a healthy romantic relationship. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, and I was only, I was able to point this out to her as a look, Leslie, you you're I could tell just by the way that you made the decision to hire me just by the way that you made life decisions in terms of your career and in your your education i mean she she even went into the army Whoa. for three years because she wanted to be the head of a particular burn unit that was a the, the, the best burn unit in the world apparently is a military burn unit oh, okay so this woman's done anything she set sure. her mind to and accomplishes it why hasn't she been able to have a successful relationship reciprocity uh. She gets so much out of her career and, and the energy and the commitment and the, and the hours and the dollars that she put into her career, she got back tenfold. Sure. Okay. But when she ever tries to put any fraction of that into a man, she can't even get back a phone call or in. whatever. She yeah. just wants to get back what she puts in. 
is, I feel like that's a fair thing to want, right? One to one? That's yeah. Not, yeah. That's not, I don't think that's unreasonable. Right. Right. So when I say to her, I go, But okay. she has more control over her professional life, potentially, than she does over someone else's feelings. Space, time. That's right. Control, space, time. But also, how is she ever going to meet a man that is going to be worthy of... But not she the, not might not worthy, care but, about that, though. But, she but might not care about she that. She might not, but also, like, if she's this super driven person that she can accomplish... She wants someone to balance. Maybe she wants someone who's, like, flim-flamming. She, to be perfectly honest with you, she, number one, she's beautiful. She's incredibly fit. She's got so much to offer. And to your point, she's not looking. She's not. It's not like oh, he's got to make a million dollars. She's not looking for that. What she really just wants is is someone to speak her love language. You know the five love yeah. languages, yeah. right? We talk about those. Yeah. What's and, yours? Uh, my number one is words. Me too. Us. Yeah. Both. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which you know, it's funny. We I did this exercise in this. I'm, getting, I'm going on so many tangents. Never mind. Anyway, the point about my doctor friend. Um, so what I explained to her was like, look, if someone were to ask you, how come you're 48 years old, never had kids, you're single, like what's going on? Like there's something wrong with you? And I'm like, no, your, your exact response would, would be, I've never been able to get the a, a, even close of, of the same return mm. on my investment that I would make into my career. Yeah from any relationship. And if I could at least find a guy who's willing to, to that I that, that's willing to put in what I'm willing to put in and can just meet me in the middle, sure. 50, 50 I'm good. I just don't want to lose. I don't want to feel like I'm wasting yeah. <gasps> my time. This person's my spirit animal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, look, I believe that in everything we do in life, if you have to take steps back in order to get ahead, like that's normal. Right, sure. like when uh, a couple decides, like, all right, look, we got to economize, got to move in with our parents for six months, got to save some money, got to be able to put some money together so we can get our own plate, whatever. You got to take steps back to, to get take ahead. the leap forward, you right? Know? Yeah. So how does that work in love? Well, I mean, it's I look, I I've always felt that love is when someone else's happiness is essential to your own. Yes. So that requires sacrifice. That requires compromise. You have to you have to want and be willing to do those things, you know. And when you said earlier about self awareness, I think that, um, and this is very existential, but um, you know, do with it what you will. Um, the meaning of life for me is is to create and and to grow and to grow anything and to create anything that inspires you, and it could be art, it could be life. It could be buildings, it could be jobs, it could be businesses, it could be anything. Mm -hmm. But what most people derive their satisfaction from in life is, is creating and growing. And when you identify a person who lacks that desire, or it, 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 is, it isn't clear and obvious to them, it's not a priority, they're more content, they're more complacent, they're, they're, they're satisfied Oh, all of these words hurt me. Are where, where they're at in life, then it's very difficult to want to to be. Who wants to hitch their horse to a wagon that isn't going anywhere? Yeah, not me. It's got a broken wheel. It's there on the side of the road. You're, you're meanwhile, you're the horse you're pulling. You ain't getting anywhere. Uh -huh. You know, nobody wants that. Horrible. No. So, so when I advise men in particular to make themselves as eligible as possible, I tell them to project this desire to grow as an individual and as a person because that's one of the most attractive things that a woman will find in you. Sure. Um, but here's the most important thing I think I need to, to convey to you, um, which is what John concluded, which is, um, you know, look, I don't believe in settling, so to speak, but I do believe in compromising. And there are women out there who have certain criteria in their mind that they're unwilling to compromise on, which I think is personally going to keep them single for much longer than they otherwise would or should. Agreed. Right? So, a lot of this has to do with these gender roles that people are used to and you know being the man being the woman and like i said you know in the context of the world that we live in now it you have to train yourself to be like look i can't be like that i can't be the one to say well you know i'm not going to date a guy unless he makes at least as much money as i do if not more it's not fair anymore that's just like guys saying i'm not going to date a girl unless she has big tits 
It what? just doesn't really matter. When you're not in, when you don't have feelings for someone, then that's what you think. I want this, 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 and this. But then you meet somebody, and if you're really open to meeting them and discovering who they are and their integrity and what the things that make you laugh and them it makes you feel happy and smile, none of that shit fucking matters. I have like a physical type. My boyfriend doesn't really look at all like that. Like, but if he, if but he, it doesn't matter. It's like you could have told me four years ago that I would have ended up with this guy. To have been like, I mean, I'm open to it, but maybe not. But like, you have to just let it happen. But how do you feel that like dating apps play into this? Because if you're only given images and what that person shares about themselves and you don't actually know them so you don't know their personality or your chemistry at all what you know is what you would have as your type or your criteria like it's hard to then oh, dating apps were so hard it's for me. hard to sacrifice yeah. some of your criteria when like you actually have nothing else to go on so like i sort of look at somebody and i'm like well do you fit what i'm looking for in theory yeah you don't know because i don't know it. you yeah now if i met somebody in person and they were i have like a height thing but if they were five nine and not five ten like i would like them to be or taller but they had the best personality well they're in front of me so yeah, i can sacrifice that one inch because they have all these other qualities but i will never get there because i'm swiping so how do i change my outlook if i'm swiping and you have an app so how would how would i use your app for instance to get over that hump of criteria all right well here, there's a lot there um first of all uh as far as my app is concerned my, my, my matchmaking and coaching practice is for the 1% of singles out there who would spend hundreds or thousands of dollars to solve these problems in their personal life. The other 99% of the population out there is self-service. Do you know, self-help, self-service, I'll do it myself. It's a do-it-yourself kind of world, dating that is. So I wanted to create a, a solution to the, a problem that almost everybody who's dating online has experienced, which is, meeting someone in person who misrepresented themselves. Mm -hmm. Now there's lots of ways to misrepresent themselves. You're using out of date photos, or you're using someone else's photos, or you're lying about your age, or your height, or people will fairly- Or what you want. Or people will fairly assume you're single when you're actually in a relationship. Dude, you can do that in person too, but did it starts know, this right. way. Did yeah. you know that 42% of people on Tinder are in relationships? Yeah, crazy. Okay, in relationships. Now, now they're wasting my swiping abilities. Now, now <laughs> let me break it down for you again, statistically. So, the same study that determined that, and they, they literally, there was over 47,000 internet users worldwide, like 33 countries, between 16 and 64 that, that were surveyed for this particular study. So, it is statistically significant and, and it's reliable longitudinal data. So, in that same study, they determined that two thirds of the, the users on dating apps worldwide are actually men, okay? And women, only one out of three women, uh, one out of three people on a dating app are women. So now let's, let's take a step back from all this data that we've already discussed here on the show, all right? So we got Title IX, we got you know changing attitudes in society about women in the workplace. We have the fact that there is statistically more women than men. 54% of, almost 54% of our population is women, and 46% is men, okay? So what's happening now is 60% of all bachelor degree holders in this country are women. Yeah, this is the datanomic stuff. Right? Mm -hmm. Yep. We're at an intereducational marriage low, in the sense that you're more likely than ever to marry someone with the same level of education as you. So if you focus on the people, the college educated, let's say, um, meaning that most people won't, won't date down mm -hmm. someone who has less education than them. Right, and it's it's rare to attract someone with more education than you who wants to be with you. So, the the statistics say you're likely to marry someone of the same educational level. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to just talk about some generalities with men and women, and and, and I, I try not to generalize, but sometimes it's fair. So I would say, let's say, um, according to John's statistics that he found, uh, there are five single college educated women for every two single college educated men okay that's what he found now if you just start there and you were to say okay well of those groups of people um what proportion of those people actually want to be in a relationship yeah that's, that's right. so let's just start, say yeah. that four out of five single college educated women would prefer to be in a relationship rather than being single is that fair yeah, yeah. okay could we say that half 
of the single men out there who are single and college educated might want to be in a relationship? Yeah. It's fair. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that goes, then you went from five to two down to four to one. Mm -hmm. So there's four single college educated women that want a relationship for every one single college educated man <laughs> yeah. who wants a relationship. And that's the fucking problem. Survival and of the fittest. Wait a minute. It gets more. There's more. So when you use the other study I was just talking about, okay, so 42% of people on Tinder are already in a relationship. 62% mm -hmm. of people on Tinder are men. Use the statistic. Yeah, there you go. So I've I've deduced this to mean that nine out of ten men on Tinder are either uninterested in, in a relationship, incapable of, already in a relationship, or all of the above. Well, lucky that me. was a nice final thought. Yeah. Ah! No, listen, there was a lot of valuable things in this. There's we could talk to you for fucking ever. For That's like actually I think a very very accurate portrayal of what's happening on the dating app sphere and obviously Love Lab is a great way to kind of try to weed out that shit. Yeah. It's just in brief, it's just a way to to have someone self verify yeah. what you see online. Which just helps along with the process. It does, and I think it is a process and it is kind of scary. Yeah. And like the old ways of thinking that like you're it's so easy to find somebody yeah it is but then there's all these things we just talked all about things. that you know kind of wipe out the options yeah and so mom and dad sorry but i'm single for a bit okay hold yeah. on it's gonna be fine I, seriously um, um real fast rapid fire our game uh okay really quick sure we can try to do this really quickly it's called top for love so sometimes we know that some people wear the pants in the relationships and sometimes you just sometimes you don't you go through the gender roles. flow gender roles like we're, we're gonna name about. celebrity couples really quick and we want you to tell us if who wears the pants if that person's in the, the dynamic and who is the love who oh, doesn't okay fun. so j-lo and a-rod j-lo yeah she's the, the tough. tough yeah okay. okay ellen degeneres and portia de rossi ellen. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, Gwen Stefani and Blake Shelton. Gwen. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> uh, George Clooney and Amal Clooney. I know who it is. Uh, you know, I'm going to say Amal. It's Amal. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so into that. I just got chills. Good for yeah. her. Uh, Jennifer Aniston and Justin Thoreau. Him. Really? Yeah. Because he's edgier, right? He's he's great. He's doing great. He's hot. He's a great career. He's good. Yeah. He's good. He's okay, good. one more. Oh, no. Well, Kim yeah. Kardashian and Kanye West. Yeah. Oh, her. Yeah, okay. Ooh, yeah, I think so, too. Okay, last one. Duchess Kate and Prince William. Her. Yep. Damn. I agree. Uh, I agree, too. Good job, Oh, guys. my God. Okay, so thank you so much for coming in. Where can everyone find you quickly? Uh, lovelab.com. Just type in my ID, lovelab, and request a chat with me on the app. Love it. And watch your Facebook Live. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Right. Um, and then you guys uh, tune in in two weeks for our guest, Cassandra Boatsock. She is like this healthy mindful guru extraordinaire life coach all the love things love her love her and guys thank you for tuning in like we said we deliver this to you free every week and we know that you've got a billion other podcasts to listen to but thank you for choosing ours and and could you like rate us while you're there Maybe tell a friend tell, like rate comment tell us your relationship status if you want to date me you call me that I don't too know. <laughs> follow us on at complicated and you could follow me at lauren leonelli on twitter facebook instagram and my website and you can follow me at jennifer golden uh, at all the same places that's right all right we will see you guys in two weeks love, love you long time from executive producers Maria Manunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.